I will be very frank with you the main aim of uh, this is to tell you that endoscopy is a very important tool that every neurosurgeon must know endoscopy. You cannot be ultimately known as an endoscopic neurosurgeon or a micro neurosurgeon. That is these are two tools which are essentially important. We cannot do without them. Yes, you have to gauge that what where all you will have to use them. It does not mean that you have an endoscope that you put your scope in every meningioma or a petroclavial meningioma from the nose and every hydrocephalus can be treated. So, just a humble impression of what exactly endoscopy can do. Endoscopy we are talking about you had a very fair idea what all we can do it from the nose, what all we can do from the after having the anatomy and the beautiful videos. Now, you know you have a fair idea of where all you can should put your endoscope, where all should not be put in endoscope. So, this is the major two indications uh, hydrocephalus and intraventricular lesions. Ventricular shunts have been the gold standard, shall be the gold standard and are the gold standards. We have to actually identify that yes, this is a necessary evil, we all have faced that evil that how can we prevent some, can some of these shunts be replaced by thermoclastomy. That is a humble answer that we have to give to ourselves. So, it is very important when you are I would say even hydrocephalus. It is not that you should put a scope in every hydrocephalus you see, that is not the treatment. Learning a technique is all, is all right, but here our main aim is giving you the, the technique, telling you the right indications, telling you a very humble situation of what exactly is to be done and not to be done and then you can take your decisions when you are going. So, we, we know that these complications are everywhere, these are from my center and every one of you will have the complications of shunt going into wrong places, having hemorrhage inside the brain, outside the brain, remove while removing it and they can cause infection, they can coming out from different places going into different situations. So, what exactly are the indications? Well accepted aqueductal stenosis, arachnoid cyst, we have seen third ventriculostomies helping them and uh, arachnoid cyst and neoplastic etiology you can take a biopsy al along with third ventriculostomy, cysty circus, we have seen all the indications. So, and relative indications are patients with repeated stunt infections post meningitic hydrocephalus, intraventricular hemorrhage. So, Pre-operative evaluation, the most important investigation is an MRI. Please do not attempt a third ventriculostomy in any hydrocephalus without an MRI. You must see the MRI T2 sagittal to look at whether there is an aqueductal stenosis and before you plan, you must have that mental image which size ventricle is larger, whether it's because you have to go from the larger size or a non-dominant side. The foramen Monroe or the third ventricle should be dilated and the floor of the third ventricle should be attenuated and bulging down. These are some criteria that you have to estimate beforehand because your entry point will also depend on that. Yes, a lot of surgeons have been very adventurous going and doing these patients under local anesthesia and sedation, but this is something which is a contraindication. Please only do these patients under general anesthesia. We position your patient supine on a head ring or a horseshoe. Incision is has to be planned. It is not a incision that I will put it on the coronal suture or somewhere between the two hairline. Take your remember because we have had, we burnt our fingers once or twice by not planning them right. Always look at the interpeduncular cistern, the line joining the interpeduncular cistern, the foramen Monroe frontal projection would be the burr hole for the third ventriculostomy on a T2 sagittal. You will always see the foramen Monroe nicely in the interpeduncular. If you are planning for an aqueductoplasty or a tumor, this will be the burr hole. So, anything between the two this will be a, the barrel will be here. But if you are planning both of them from the same barrel, it is better that there are two things that are very important. The foramen monroe must be dilated on your MRI and your that is one thing. Second, your barrel should be not a small 8 millimeter or a drill barrel which is around about 5 millimeter in diameter. It should be a nice 8 to 10 millimeter Martin barrel which we, we can negotiate and fulcrum on both the sides. Because the main problem where the, the scope hits and damages is here is the fortnix that you must plan. So, for the fenestration, you have to fenestrate the third ventricle floor at the thinnest part of the tuber sinarium between the mammillary bodies and the infundibular recess. The best way is to fenestrate it as a Fogarty or a bipolar, do not use current and or a fine scissors after some practice, a fine scissors over the dorsum cell I will show you. Then dilation is very important, dilation of both the membranes. Sometimes the second membrane is not there, but nearly 70 percent of times the second membrane is always there you, and you must fenestrate it and dilate it with a ventriculostomy probe that can also be used. It is very important when you are doing children. In less than two years, your success comes down to around 50 percent. After two years in aqueductal stenosis, your success is as high as 80 to 90 percent and sometimes even some series say 100 percent. A series from GE Panth Hospital said 100 percent. You must have a right indication and plan your third ventriculostomy. In children, even till they are five years of age, there is higher chance of CSF leak. How to prevent the CSF leak is when you are making a bar hole, do not take linear incision, a semicircular, semi-lunar incision the barrel being in sitting in the center of that, you can take a small flap put it down or you can preserve all the bone dust and 
pack it back along with some gel foam. Try to make a flap of the dural incision so that you can pick it back. But the most important is plugging of the cortical wound. Once you have taken out your scope, do not just put, your, put some sponge stand over that and make a big cylinder of a gel foam and just plug that wound so that uh, some of it coming back so it does not drop in actually. That is the main idea so that you can. So this is a simple third ventriculostomy with the tectal plate lesion. You can consider it with a Fogarty or with the bipolar without any current. So you can see the second membrane that is the, that's the mammillary bodies. Be as away from the mammillary bodies as possible. Just close to a, a translucent structure which is the dorsum cellae. Then you start dilating with the 3, 4, 4 or 5 French. When you are dilating it is very important, just see the movements. When you are dilating your balloons should start coming out. You should not dilate between the brainstem and the clivus. So your balloon, you, you inflate it and when you are dilating you keep, keep on coming out, otherwise you will avulse the perforators. Never dilate it when you are between the two, that is the most important thing. And this is something you must see, the bacillar is after some practice you can do some difficult ones. These are younger children who have chronic hydrocephalus and these the membrane becomes thin, nearly transparent. You will see the thing. In the previous one it was an acquired hydrocephalus uh, because of tectal plate tumor. The, it was translucent but this is transparent here. This is the dorsum cellae. We are trying to puncture with a 3 French, a 4 French and a 5 French. Nothing happens. It's it is pretty transparent, you think it is pretty thin, nothing is, it is not puncturing. These are the cases for the first 10, 15 cases please abandon. You can, because this is dipping down till the mid clivus, the arachnoid. So we tried with the 5 French, you all the time going towards the bacillar. We tried with the bipolar as well. But after some cases, the simplest thing which we realize is rather make, making punctures, it is to just give a slit over the dorsum cell. The moment you give a slit because this membrane is already tense. It just flips, slips back, slips back and you, it starts flapping there and you can see the second membrane as well and you can see the second membrane as well and the flapping is yet not come because the CSA pathways have not, not yet opened. The moment you open it and you see the flapping there. Now you have to dilate it and your dilation like I previously said it is, there is hardly any space there. The moment you are putting your balloon, keep, start withdrawing it, always fill your balloon with water or saline, I am sorry, but not with air. For Garty is in cardiac and all is all right, but in neurosurgery, because what happens is if you are if you're just putting in putting in air, your balloon dilates in asymmetric proportions. When you are putting in saline through that, it is a symmetrical and a slow dilation. What we want is a slow dilation. These were the aqueductoplasties which we used to do 10, 12 years ago. We do not do any more because once you learn a procedure, you want to go with your endoscopes everywhere. So, but when you start having literature complications, your own because you are, you are, we used to do aqueductoplasty, this is the third ventriculostomy. Then we used to bend our scopes back, put in, reach the aqueduct. These are clear cut indications like membrane stenosis or membrane or an aqueductal membrane which you can dilate and these are clear cut indications that, that can be possible. But yes, you do not need to put stents now, now literature is gone against stents. That is an aqueductal stenosis. We used to put a Fogarty dilated put some stents earlier, not doing any more. Why I am showing this is, this is something that should not be done. So how do you know that it is technically good? Your flap started, uh, your arachnoid and second membrane starts flapping, it is a signal. There is, you must do a regular head circumference measurement. Serial CT scans are not required, but an early CT scans followed by a, a slightly delayed MRI scan will be 6 months down the line. The hole you have made, you must see the CSF flowing on a T2, you will have a cine film showing that. This is something very, we always when we do third ventriculostomies and some people who are already doing them, you realize that uh, small kids, you do a third ventriculostomy and after a week or two, the head is still big, the fontanel is still level, it is not tense and you have a double mind whether my, my thing is not working and you will read literature to start doing lumbar punctures, lumbar punctures and lumbar, do not do all that because if it is not functioning, it will not function. You cannot make it function. You have to just withhold the child with, there with you, do not discharge. If the fontanel starts bulging. And if your pseudomeningocele start not frontal and your wound starts bulging, there is a pseudomeningocele there and the first drop of CSF if it leaks, so that is the sign that it is, there is an absorption failure, please do a shunt. But these are the small things that you must note, a 10 to 50 percent reduction of ventricular size, disappearance of a peri periventricular ooze, presence of a CSF flow on uh, through, the, through the ostomy area, straightening of the floor of the third ventricle, 
resolution of the suprapineal third or the posterior third ventricle recess and prominence of the sulci. This is something, this is a very, uh, this is something that you have to note on your CT scan or an MRI that the periventricular lucency disappears. The, the ventricular size is the same, the child is better but and the sulci and gyri are better seen. And on a third three month MRI you can see a CSF low, that was an aqueductoplasty as well we did. When does ETB fail? This is a very important question. ETBs fail. They can be nearly failure because of absorption problem, usually within the first four weeks. But they can fail till five years. An ETB which does not fail till five years never fails. So the longer you have a follow up, the longer the chances that your ETB will not fail. So that is a very important thing that you have to keep on following up these children or these adolescents for at least five years when you are uh, doing. Rare failure has been reported after five years. So the etiology is the most important predictor. Previous meningitis, myelomeningocele cells, shunt infection, previous shunt malfunction. So uh, what are the complications? Third ventriculostomy is not without complications. This is something that is can, you cannot prevent at all. This is uh, not preventable at all. CSF absorption failure, you have to do a shunt. What are partly preventable is that is something that you can do and CSF leaks, meningitis, stoma closure, gliosis, do not use monopolars or bipolars when doing a third ventriculostomy. There will be, there will be gliosis, natural reaction, a difficult perforation. Totally preventable is something that directly related to your skills. A second membrane perforation you must see, you must not be happy with only one membrane and but this is uh, damage to a hypothalamus or thalamus or injury to a basilar artery. Wherever in doubt, you are putting an endoscope, put, convert it into a shunt. Shunt is a gold standard, believe me. Yes, you can buy. By doing a third ventriculostomy, you can prevent repeat shunts and maybe 30 to 80 percent of your patients will be cured forever. So what is the plan? When you have a patient with, with, with hydrocephalus, do a third ventriculostomy, follow him or, or her for the next five years. The patient is unwell, do an MRI. If the CSF flow is there, that means your ostomy is not functioning, do a VP shunt. If it is not there, you can explore again. You can plan to a, do a redo if there is the stoma is closed, but if the stoma is open, that means you are good, but it is not your fault, it is nature's. So there is not too much of difference statistically till now between shunts and, and, and endoscopy. But yes, there has been over the last over several series uh, throughout literature, average success is 22 percent to 94 percent depending on etiology, overall around above 90 percent. We have our share of publications from our department. Overall, the ideology is that post meningitic, post myelomeningocele, post infectious, post hemorrhagic, the range is between 20 to 40 percent success. Pediatric, less than two weeks, one year comes down to 40 percent, one to two years is around between 40 to 60 percent and more than two years it comes around what 80 to nearly 100 percent, there is some series with 100 percent as well. So it is a necessary evil, you should plan it, thank you. Endoscope is something very remarkable, it gives you a better vision, what you could see in arachnoid cyst and all. In colloid cyst, yes, the gold standard is microsurgery. We have the largest series in the world, we have nearly 78 cases, out of that 45 to 48 I have done myself. But still after doing everything then you realize that uh, the residual cysts throughout the literature, we have we have around about 18 percent residual cysts and out of them maybe we have operated three of them, reoperated. I have operated, reoperated one, my colleagues have reoperated another two. So you cannot remove the complete cyst in nearly 20 percent. In, in the early part of your experience, maybe 25 percent, 30 percent, later on you can come down to 18 percent. Now over the last two years, my residual cysts have been practically nil because I am selecting my cases. So even in large ventricles, if you have a colloid cyst, you have to select uh, your cases on the basis of the MRI. Do not take calcified colloid cysts with very bright and hypo and T2 and these retro projecting uh, colloid cysts which I will show. These are the cysts which you can plan, but if you plan them well, if you select them well, the your results can be 100 percent. Because that is another problem with colloid cysts, you cannot just put your scope into the caucus point and take it out. You have to plan on the MRI because your attachment is here, your attachment is not here. So you have to put your scope in such a manner around about 4 centimeters in front of the coronal suture that you are actually seeing the back of your cyst. That is where it is adherent to the choroid plexus and adherent to the internal cerebral veins. That is the reason why uh, the subcoroidal and the supracoroidal approaches were defined. So that you can enlarge the foramen of Monroe by a microsurgical approach and remove those retro projecting cysts. Retro projecting cysts you cannot just put a scope through the foramen of Monroe and pull them out, you will damage the patient or leave the cyst behind. It will be better to leave the wall behind than to, else walls do not recur, but yes in our series three of them have, have recurred. Go from the largest side. And this is something we have already talked here. Yeah, even if there is a, a similar dilation and you can see central septal, septum polysnum, look at the choroid plexus where you can see more of the cyst medial to it, you can puncture that it there. These are nice cysts to operate, colloid cysts. If they are projecting into the septum polysnum, they are one of the variants in which they hide the Furman Monroe down and they are projecting it into the septum polysnum. They are very good microsurgically and they are very beautiful by endoscopy. You can just 
cut over the septum pellucidum and uh, aspirate the cysts because they are not projecting into the foramen monroe at all. The foramen monroe is hidden and that is the choroid plexus. You can just aspirate these cysts. What you can see and visualization is much better. The only problem is bleeding. If you have some bleeding from the choroid plexus areas, you have to may have to convert or have to wait for some time. So once you start aspirating, you start seeing the foramen monroe. Never coagulate at the wall because that's the wall. The wall will be always adherent to a single or a bilateral choroid plexus. Keep on gentle aspirating on the cyst wall. That's the colloid that you have to take out. If the colloid is thick, you can take a biopsy forceps and break them in uh, portions. Then you have to, with the new system, the lotus system, you can catch hold of the part of the capsule, coagulate the, the choroid plexus, and by holding it and cutting it with sharp dissection. That's the only way to remove this, even microsurgically. Just imagine if now this formal mono is open because the cyst has come up. Had the cyst been projecting down like this? So you could have seen this portion, but not this portion. So you could not have pulled it out. So that is the reason why the microsurgical approaches like supracoroidal or subcoroidal approaches have come, have come in. You should only attempt on colloid cyst if you have done at least 20, 25, 30 ventriculostomies. You deliver it like a gallbladder you deliver because it is pretty, pretty large. So now we can, we, we can finish.